Good morning. Good morning. I am Tim Roberts. I'm the pastor here at First United Methodist in Lincoln, and it's good to see you. And for those of you who are joining online, I hope that you're able to see us a whole lot better than you did last week, which I hope was better than even the week before. Uh, we are upgrading our technology a little bit so that our online worshipers are able to uh, experience uh, worship in a, in, a, in a deeper, more meaningful way. And so we hope that this works even better for you. But uh, I got a few announcements I'd like to get to, to make before we get started. As you picked up your bulletin today, and those online, you can find the bulletin link uh, in the comment section. Uh, as you open it up, you see that there's a place for uh, you to let us know you've been here. It says, welcome guests, members. What I'd like for you to do is just put your name down on it. Uh, if you're a guest, we'd like for you to fill out all the information. Or if you're a member, that's contact information has changed, please fill it out. And as you leave today, you can drop it at in the, uh, the offering plates, which you will find at any of the doors online. Just give us a, 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 send us an email, let us know any type of uh, updates you'd like to make. And let us know you're here today. You can do a wave and maybe somebody who's watching with you will wave back. And, uh, but if you're a guest today, please fill this out so we can get some information out to you about first. And if you're a guest, this is the only gift that we ask of you today. On the back side of that, there's a place for you to let us know any prayer concerns that you would like to share with me and or the church. Again, fill it out, drop it in the offer plate as you leave today. Online, uh, just let us know any prayers you have, or you can send me an email directly if you'd like for it to be confidential. Matter of fact, those of you here, if you uh, recognize this, there's a box about midway down that if you want this to go out to everybody, please check that box. If the box is not checked, I do not share that information with anybody. I do not share anything about anybody unless I have your permission. So if you tell me something, uh, uh, know that it's in confidence until you tell me otherwise. Now here's some in, uh, announcements for you. First thing is this, right after worship today, immediately <laughs> after worship today, at noon or so, we will have an Advent lunch. I hope that you did not make other lunch plans because this is going to be a great uh, time for us to be together and have uh, uh, some wonderful food. I know it's going to be wonderful. Uh, if you're watching at home, I'm sorry, we can't help you with that. Um, uh, <coughs> the light just went out, so I don't know what happened. Uh, anyway, uh, I hope that you are able to uh, stay today. And again, that's right after worship today. And uh, next Saturday, this coming Saturday at 1 o'clock, we will be caroling downtown. So if you would like, at 1 o'clock, just come join us. Uh, they have even tried to recruit me to lead. I'm not going to lead. You don't want that, I promise. But uh, let's join together and just uh, walk around downtown singing some of your favorite carols, and you'll have a wonderful time. Uh, and two weeks from today... Uh, we will have the Moravian Love Feast here in the, worship, uh, in the sanctuary at 7 p.m. We will also, on the 24th, Saturday the 24th, have a communion candlelight service at 5 p.m. here in the worship, uh, excuse me, sanctuary. So please uh, plan to be here for that. Now, the big one is this. <coughs> on Christmas Day, we will gather for worship, and I hope that you'll be able to be here. But we are going to have worship at 10 a.m., not 11. So what I want us to do, so I know that everybody understands this, what time are we having worship on Christmas? 10. 10. 10. 10. There you go. Why are we doing this? Because there are a lot of, of you, myself included, who have plans with family. We still want to worship, but we want to be able to get to our families as well and uh, not prolong their lunch plan. So 10 a.m. on Christmas. That is the only time that we're changing worship uh, times that I know of. And actually, that's all the announcements I have, unless somebody has some others. <coughs> Very good. Because, brothers and sisters, this is the day the Lord has made. So let us rejoice and be glad in it.
morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. My name is Joe Lockman. I invite you to join with me in a call to worship, which you'll find in the bulletin and on the screen. Please stand as you are able. <coughs> Across the universe, creation waits for the prophets to speak their word of expectation and their vision of renewal. May we, May we gather, gather around them today once, once more, more and let their longing grip us and lead us into birth and blessing. blessing. So come now, my friends. This is the meeting place of promise and prophecy. Let us listen to the ancient words that we might be ready to hear a baby's cry. Now let us continue to worship <coughs> as we join together in singing hymn number 204, Emmanuel, Emmanuel. <laughs> Today, we celebrate the second Sunday in the season of Advent. This season proclaims the comings of Christ, whose birth we prepare to celebrate once again, who comes continually to us in word and spirit, and whose return in final victory we anticipate. Now, as we prepare for the lighting of the Advent wreath, 
Let us hear from the Gospel of Mark, <coughs> chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. <coughs> See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. This morning, we relight the first Advent calendar, a candle, <laughs> which reminds us that Christ is our hope. Now, we light the second Advent candle as it symbolizes that Christ is the way. Let us pray. God, may the word that you sent through the prophets lead us to lead us lead us to the way of salvation. Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Join us in singing the second verse, O come, O come, Emmanuel, which you'll find in your hymnal on page two eleven. Also in the screen. at it. What color do you see on it mainly? White and gold. Do you see anywhere where there's a different color? Well, that too. Go ahead and take candy canes. Okay. Let's have a seat over here. Now, is that better? Okay. <laughs> so there was a, well, I thought it was talking pretty loud. There was a German candy maker, and so what he does, what colors are yours? Pink and red, because those ones are cherry. Yeah, yeah, those ones are good. But normally, they're red and white. And that's because the stripes are red, because that reminds us of the blood that Jesus shed for us when he died. The white is also for Jesus because it's he's our savior. And then if you look, what does this look like? The kind of hook. Remember how um, like shepherds 
So that's how they use, and they grab the hook to get a sheep out of trouble. So they use the hook, but what happens? <coughs> Turn it upside down. What's it look like now? Fishing, yeah, because Jesus did fishing, but what else? What letter? The J, the letter J for Jesus. So around this time, we're just given this. Peppermint, I'm not sure, just because it's an, a mint, I guess, <laughs> an everlasting color. Didn't say on here what that one was for. But it's, it's a symbol, every time you have one, to bring joy and remember Jesus, because Jesus is the reason for the season. So let's have a prayer. Thank you, God, for loving us, for giving us Jesus, and giving us love. In Jesus' name, amen. My name is Vicki Andrews, and I just have a few words about our backpack program today. Our church has had a successful backpack program for almost 13 years. Even with the rising cost of food, we were able to provide 20 children from GE Massey free groceries for weekends and school breaks. <coughs> These backpacks include healthy food for child-friendly meals. They include breakfast items such as cereal, oatmeal, and grits. Also, easy to prepare meals with mac and cheese, ramen noodle, canned soup, pasta, fruit, and vegetables, as well as snacks. For Thanksgiving, we purchased food line food cards to make the Thanksgiving holiday a bit more special for our backpack children's holiday. Currently, there are 15 individuals involved in the backpack program as shoppers, packers, and deliverers of backpacks to the school. Many, many of our church members make regular financial contributions to help this program continue. Whitney, our previous backpack coordinator, established a partnership with Artisan Church. Over the summer months, their congregation collected special food items to be used this fall in the backpack program, as well as food line food cards to be sent home over Thanksgiving. I want to personally thank Rosalind for stepping up after Whitney left and coordinating a lot of the backpack efforts and keeping us all informed. London Bradshaw, counselor at GE Massey, said it best. For some students, the backpack program means having something in the house to eat over the weekends. For some, it is their only means of security, nourishment, or love left felt. Please continue to support this much needed program with your gifts and prayers and today, there are envelopes on the table in the fellowship hall if you would like to make a contribution. Thank you so much. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conce conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, 
and he gave him the name Jesus. This is the word of God to the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our anthem this morning requires some audience participation. So please have your bulletins out and see where the reading is under the anthem, and we would love for you to participate with us in the reading.
Today we continue in with this second week of Advent, journeying back to Bethlehem. And as we do that, it's, it's not just a, a, a place that we go to, but it's a place within our heart. And to help us understand a little bit better what was going on in the time, we're looking at certain individuals and understanding what they were experiencing on that blessed night when Jesus was born. And today we're going to be looking at uh, Joseph. And so I'd like for us to begin this time with a prayer. So if you would just hold your palms out, uh, hands out, palms up. Those of you online, you can join us well. Just join us in, in whatever posture you would like and pray this prayer with me. Lord, I offer myself to you. Open my ears to hear. And my heart to receive, heart to receive. All, you have for me today. all you have for me today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're talking about Joseph today, but exactly what do we know about this man, Joseph? What, what do you know about him? Carpenter. He was a carpenter. What else? He was a righteous man. He doesn't speak in the Bible. Okay, I think I can just kind of go on home now because y'all are getting a lot of what I'm going to be covering. <laughs> I like that. He said if you come to the crave class and you would already know a lot of this. Thanks for that. Say that again. He surely loved Mary. You know, there's not a lot that we do know about him, but this we do know. Well, in, in order to understand Joseph, we're also going to have to go back a little bit and understand Mary as well. So, you know, last week we talked about Mary, and, and we looked at her story through the Gospel of Luke because Luke kind of lays out, it traces the lineage of Jesus uh, through Mary. And the way my, uh, one of my professors put it at one time, the reason they did that is to kind of show Jesus' humanity, but also because of some skeptics about who uh, could, could Jesus really be heir to the throne if, uh, if, it wasn't, if he wasn't really Joseph's son. So the way they looked at it was, uh, what was that phrase? Oh, Mother's baby, father's maybe. So, I mean, think through that just a moment. And you, you will see that through Luke, it traces the lineage all the way back to David through Mary. But Matthew traces the lineage through Joseph because Joseph was the legal father. He was the adoptive father of Jesus. Therefore, he was the legal father, and therefore he could, Jesus could uh, be established or have a legal claim and right to the throne because he was through uh, um, uh, a, a, an offspring of um, David. So now we know about the lineage, but have you ever thought much about where Joseph was from? You know, we're not told. Now, we do know that Mary was from Nazareth. And some believe that Joseph was from Nazareth, uh, Nazareth as well because, you know, it, it seems to just fit very well because, you know, they were engaged and, and, and so they were probably there with each other. But the Bible is not clear about where Joseph is from. But I believe that he was from Bethlehem. Now, we know that his ancestry comes through Bethlehem, but we also look at it this way. Whenever it says that uh, Crinius, uh, the governor, uh, sent out a decree to all the world that they would be taxed and that each man was to go back to his hometown, I believe this was because Joseph was from Bethlehem. This is uh, because Crinius was Roman. He could care less about David, King David, and his ancestry. He didn't care about that. And so it would make more sense for the uh, man to go back to his birth town, 
Not where he's living right now, but his birth town. And so I kind of believe that he's from Bethlehem. There's some other things, but it's really not important to the story. But maybe something that is, is to know that uh, between Bethlehem and Nazareth, it's about 70 miles. So if Joseph was living in Bethlehem, then there was a, this was a long distance relationship. It was probably a marriage that had been prearranged. And uh, there had to be some traveling to go back. So we're talking about Bethlehem. Bethlehem, you know, is the birthplace of Jesus. So let's take a look at it. And as we do that, I, the way I want us to do this is to go to Bethlehem as it looks today. So here's a few pictures that we took uh, while we were in Bethlehem a few months ago. This is what it looks like today. Very different than what it would have looked uh, uh, 2,000 years ago. It's, it's, a, it's a town of about 28 to 30,000 people. Uh, you can see that it is, uh, in, in some places it's, it's built up, in other places it's quite desolate. Uh, this is the church of the uh, nativity. This is where uh, the church was built on what is believed to be the birth spot of Jesus. And matter of fact, uh, one of our group members is kneeling at a kind of a small altar. And just inside what looks like the fireplace is the spot where they believe was where uh, Jesus was born. Now, was it this actual spot? We, we don't know, but we know it was in this community. And uh, just about, what, about 10 feet away or so, it was, there was a, another room where it uh, dedicated to where they believed the manger would have been, where Jesus was laid. So this is what it looks like today. Now, uh, Bethlehem is about six miles southwest of Jerusalem. And from Bethlehem, you can look back and you can see Jerusalem in the background. Uh, and Bethlehem is located almost in a desert on a hillside. Uh, actually, I've got a picture of this. That's uh, the Herodian there uh, in the background. But I'm not, no, I'm not going to talk about that today. We'll talk about that next week. Currently, Bethlehem is part of the West Bank. Now, the West Bank, if you remember, Israel, the, the, the state of Israel was created in 1948. And it was, it was kind of trying to be an appeasement for the, the Jews, uh, especially who had just gone through the Holocaust, uh, to give them their own land. But it was not something that was well received in that area. And as a matter of fact, three years after the creation, or two years after the creation, two to three years after creation, in 1950, uh, Jordan, the, the country Jordan, invaded and took back what they believed was theirs. This was the West Bank. They were really wanting to go all the way to the Mediterranean Sea. Why is that? I don't believe I have a good picture of why this would be, uh, but I want you to just kind of imagine in your mind that Jordan uh, only has a very small area that they have access to the sea. And as you know, most commerce goes still by sea. And with that very small access, which is there at the Red Sea, they have to do a lot of traveling to get any goods in or out of Jordan. And that's going by through uh, between Egypt and Saudi Arabia. And you know these countries are not always on the best terms with each other. And so Jordan was wanting to claim area all the way back to the Mediterranean Sea so they could once again uh, have this free-flowing uh, trade agreements. Isn't that amazing? We today think that the uh, uh, United States is so central to what's going on in the world. But yet, here we are in the 20th and the 21st century, and so much commerce and so much trade and so much still centers around this area of Israel. 
the same things that we've been uh, looking at for over a year now about uh, the, 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 uh, uh, Israel being there almost like an interstate between Africa and Europe and Asia still exists today, but beyond that. So it's still a very much contested land. So it's still part of this area called the West Bank. And it is populated, Bethlehem, mainly by Muslims. 100 years ago, 84% of the population of Bethlehem was Christian. Today, 2022, the, the latest figure, which is not the most current figure, is less than 10%. And matter of fact, our tour guide, if I'm not mistaken, said it was probably more like 1% to 2% is Christian. So out of that uh, 30,000 people are there, we're talking about probably between uh, three and 600 people are actually Christian, the rest are Muslims. And they are dying out. Being in the West Bank, it is also surrounded by this 23-foot wall. And probably the one place that we felt uh, the, the most tense in our travels was trying to get through the checkpoint. Because this was a place that you could not take any pictures. You're not going to find pictures on the internet of the checkpoint. You will find pictures of the wall. But on one side, you have this prosperous Jerusalem. And on the other side, you have a Bethlehem, which is kind of, kind of run down. And it felt a little bit unsafe in places. And so this wall serves as a reminder to the people there every day of this conflict that they're having to, to go through. Every day they are feeling, they still feel like that they are in some type of prison. But here's what I have found out. On both sides of that wall, most people just want to live their life in peace. But there are some who refuse to allow that peace to happen. And here it is, Bethlehem. The birthplace of the Prince of Peace. And you're still reminded that this world is not a peaceful place. So two groups claim this area. You have the Palestinians that, that, that said that well, this land was taken from us. This was our land first. And it was taken from us. And then you had the Israelis who say this land was given to us by God. So you will always have this conflict, this tension between the two groups. Even though most people just want to live their lives in peace. Even in Jesus' time, there was conflict. The area was occupied by, by foreign invaders, the, the Romans. And at the time of Jesus, uh, you, you had um, Bethlehem was in the, in the area of Judea, or that's the, the uh, Greek word for Judah. Uh, and at the time, it was, like I said, it was, there's about 70 miles between Bethlehem and Nazareth. And uh, there was probably about 500 to 1,000 people in Bethlehem. So it, it, was, it was a nice-sized town, but still relatively small compared to Jerusalem. And even at 500 to 1,000, it was still 5 to 10 times larger than Nazareth. And it's probably, you know, it's being 70 miles apart, it was probably, uh, uh, probably took about three days to travel there. But Bethlehem from Jerusalem, being six miles, took about two to three hours to walk. Now, Bethlehem was the home to, to farmers and millers and bakers and shepherds. And actually, probably a lot of bakeries because the, the name Bethlehem itself means house of bread. And so the, they, they probably baked a lot of bread there and then took it to Jerusalem to sell. And one thing that we do know for sure is that Bethlehem was also the hometown of the Jewish greatest king, King David. 
and that even today it is still known as the city of David. So this is where Joseph is from. But what can we know about Joseph himself and what can we learn from him? Well, really, to better understand Joseph, we need to look at the culture around uh, at the time. Joseph was a quiet man. He did not have a Facebook account. He didn't post any selfies on Instagram. There, there, there's no Polaroids of what Joseph looked like. So we have to use our imagination of what he looked like. And those vary. Our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters, many of them, uh, believe that Joseph was a, a much older man. And so a lot of times you'll see Joseph depicted like this, uh, this uh, picture from 1640 by uh, Guido uh, uh, René. Uh, they, they think he was a much older man. and He was more of a fatherly figure, or he maybe even a grandfatherly figure to Mary. And that uh, they, they use this because, if you remember, they, they continue to call Mary the Virgin Mary, and they believe that she remained a perpetual virgin. And so Joseph was this, was this older man who took care of her, but was never like a, a real husband to her. And that any of uh, Jesus' siblings were children that Joseph had from a previous marriage. marriage. But the thing is that we're, we're not told how old Joseph is, and we're not really even told how old Mary is. We can only speculate this from what we know to be true of others at that time. So other traditions, including the Protestants, picture Joseph as a, a much younger man. And we believe this because in that day and age, men were uh, engaged when they were uh, around 15 years old, between 14 and 16 years old. About, about the time that they were able to, to become some type of craftsman or learn some type of trade and provide for a family, that's when they would become engaged. And the women were probably anywhere between 12 and 14 years old. So about the time that they were able to start bearing children, the, these young men, young women, boys and girls would, would become engaged. Now, they, they were engaged, they were legally married to one another, but they did not live together for at least a year. So we don't know a lot about Joseph. As you heard, he, he, he's a man of few words. As a matter of fact, as it was brought out, you're not going to find in the Bible any words that Joseph spoke. So he, his actions are what we look to more than anything else. Joseph was a tecton. Tecton means builder. And in that area, most structures were made out of stone. And so wood was not something that was abundant. And, and the wood that was there was not suitable for construction. So tectons were usually more like carpenters the, they built doors for these stone buildings or, or these caves and, and they built farm implements so it was a very humble profession it was not one that you were going to buy the best camels uh, and and uh, uh, you know bling those out and put the low riders on you, you weren't going to do that it was a very humble profession so here we are. Let's say Joseph, 15 years old. Married, engaged to Mary. Probably been engaged for just a little bit of time. Maybe looking forward to it, and all of a sudden, he finds out, and it doesn't say that Mary told him, it's just that he finds out that Mary is pregnant. And you know what he thinks first off? I'm not the father. 
Now, you heard just a moment ago that one of the descriptions that we have for Joseph is that he is a righteous man. That's the way it's put in some translations, that he's a righteous man. I, I kind of appreciate the way that the New International Version puts it, where it says this, um, uh, he was faithful to the law. The reason I like that is because whenever we think of somebody being righteous, we, we think of them as almost holy. But we got to remember, Joseph was about 15 years old. And he just found out that the woman that he was married to is pregnant. And he's not the daddy. So you can imagine everything going through him. He was probably uh, quite angry. He was jealous. He was probably hurt and heartbroken. And he was faithful to the law, righteous, which means he knew that something had to be done. Yet there was something deep within him that did not want to hurt Mary any further than need be. Because he knew Mary was, was with the child, which constituted adultery. You remember what happened to adulterers, women especially at that time? They were stoned to death. He didn't want that to happen to Mary. So he decided he would quietly divorce her. And I, I appreciate the way they say quietly divorce her. He didn't want to bring any more embarrassment on her. But even that was probably something that was he was thinking, well, she's going to get what she deserves. Because whenever somebody was divorced, or a woman was divorced, you know, we, we'd like to think that you know, everything goes back to normal. But it didn't. Most of the time, the families would disown that girl. And so here she would have been, without a husband, a known adulteress, Her family had disowned her. What was left for her? To be a single, unwed, teenage mother. That wasn't going to be much of a life, would it? Well, he decides to divorce her quietly. and um, This was to show that Joseph was faithful to the law, yet still had some compassion for Mary so not that she would not be put to death. Well, an angel visits Joseph in a dream. An angel says, Joseph, this baby that Mary's carrying is the son of God. And you're going to name him jo uh, Jesus. Because this child will save the people from their sins. The name Jesus means God is salvation. Now Joseph gets up and he does exactly as he's instructed. But there's this curious little part that, that's wedged in between that dream and, and where Joseph gets up. Where Matthew's not talking to Joseph, the angel's not talking to Joseph. Joseph it, it, it doesn't even know what's going on here. Matthew is laying this part out for the hearer, for you and me, and especially for those first century people who were Jewish and trying to figure all of this out and, and how the law and the legalist, legalism comes in. He was laying this out for them. He said, this is to fulfill what was said by the prophet Isaiah, and it comes from Isaiah 7, that uh, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, God with us. Well, we 
we think, okay, hold on, but, but, but his, the angel just said, call him Jesus. Why are they saying Emmanuel here? Well, that's because what happened in Isaiah happened 735 years before this. 735 years before the birth of Jesus, King Ahaz of Israel is holed up in Jerusalem, and the, the kings of Israel and, and Syria, or, or no, King Ahaz was, was the king of Judah, and the kings of Israel and Syria have teamed up and are now con- coming to conquer Judah. And the people of Judah are terrified as they see themselves being surrounded. And the prophet Isaiah comes up to, and, and, and says to King Ahaz, you don't have to be afraid. God is with you. These kings that, and these uh, armies that you see, they will be defeated. And so that you know that God is doing a good thing and God's going to give you a sign. And this is it. A virgin or a young girl will give birth to a son and he will be called Emmanuel. Emmanuel meaning God with us. And just a few years after this, about a little over 10 years uh, later, uh, the kings of Israel and Syria are destroyed. And so what Matthew is trying to do here is, is bring history back into the present day and say, do you remember what happened then that where God is with us? It's happening again in your, in your presence. God is with you again. What happened then is happening again now. And Jesus is a sign from God to remind us that we are not alone. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. What had been invisible, God, is becoming visible. You will now see with your very eyes, not just with your faith, but with your very eyes, that God is always with you. And even today, my brothers and sisters, we can see that. When we see this Christmas tree, when we we see the manger scenes, when we see the cross, we're reminded God is with us. What has happened before is happening again now and will happen again. Advent, waiting for Jesus, waiting for Jesus. From the past to the future. Now, Joseph, let, let's finish this up because I know y'all are getting hungry. <clears throat> Joseph is mentioned in all four Gospels. But nothing is mentioned about him after the Passover event when Jesus is 12. Now, here's the strange thing. Mary's mentioned a lot. Jesus mentions Mary. But Jesus is never recorded as ever mentioning Joseph. So does that make Joseph a deadbeat dad who just kind of abandoned or maybe uh, his family or, or maybe he, he died at an early age? We don't know. But I, I can say this. Joseph must have made a big impact on Jesus' life. Because the spiritual life of Jesus reflects this impact. When he says anything about God, Father, when he says, in my Father's house, he doesn't say Father in this, in this separate, reverent style. The word he uses is Abba. Best translate for us is Daddy. It kind of puts a new spin on it, right? Our Father in heaven, our Daddy in heaven. And while he's teaching to the tax collectors and the sinners, he talks about a prodigal son and how the, 
how the father came running out and wrapped his arms around him when he was still yet a small speck. That this, this, this father, this Abba, this daddy came running to receive him back. There must have been something special between Jesus and Joseph for him to refer to fathers in such a loving and endearing way. Yeah, Joseph, he was a humble tecton, a humble carpenter. He poured his life into Jesus and in his own way helped shape him into what he would become. Now, within the United Methodism, we don't have saints, really, or, or not patron saints. We, we kind of believe all of us are, are saints. But for our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters, Joseph is the patr patron saint of all of those who serve quietly in the background, never wanting to be noticed. And as I look out at many of you, I bet you can identify with that. Because many of you say, yeah, I will help, but I'm not going to lead. <laughs> I don't want to be on camera. I don't want to be noticed or anything. I just want to help. That would be Joseph. And the funny thing is that Joseph had the greatest position that any male ever had and did it without any fanfare. And that was okay because he did it. Because God asked him. And that was enough. So for many of us here today, you can identify with Joseph. You're just saying, Lord, wherever you put me, let me be your humble servant. And I will serve, just like Joseph. Let's pray. Oh, gracious God, we thank you so much for the life of Joseph. We don't know a lot about him, but God, we know that Jesus loved him. Loved him enough to, to use his experience with, uh, with Joseph to help describe our relationship with you. That you're not just off on your own and, and someone to be separate and revered. But you intimately love us and yearn to have that intimate relationship with us. Because you are our dead in heaven. He taught us that in this prayer and in the prayer that we pray now. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, my brothers and sisters, let's close out this time of worship with a song about the town we just talked of. And that is Bethlehem. As we come together and join in, as we sing... Uh, hymn number 230, also on the screen, O Little Town of Bethlehem.
and receive now this, your blessing. Well, and this as a blessing before the meal. May God fill you with his Holy Spirit. And as we eat together, may you feel God's love enter in once again to give you peace, joy, hope, and a sense of belonging as we journey back in time to experience the birth of Jesus. So go, eat, fellowship, and may God's blessing be upon you now and always. Amen.